Lord, open my lips. And my mouth shall proclaim your grace. In the beginning, before time, before people, before the world began, God bless us. Here and now among us, beside us, enlisting the people of earth for the purposes of heaven, God is. In the future, when we have turned to dust and all we know has found its fulfillment, God will be. Not denying the world, but delighting in it. Not condemning the world, but redeeming it. Through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God was, God is, God will be. Oh. 
to begin again and again and again. Let us praise God with joyful hearts and acts of kindness. In that sense of gratitude for forgiveness given and God's love to each of us, let us now share the peace of Christ with one another. Janice, Kathy, Shereen, and Lori, 
Um, so a big happy birthday, and we've got some of her sisters here with us. So glad you could join us. And we're really glad because they also brought the treats today. So thank you, y'all. Uh, special thank you to our adult choir who is offering our first our ministry of music today. So thank you. Good to have you with us. And we've got other birthdays to celebrate. Today we have Sophie Landowski, Tampa Gluck, and Susan Kist, who I know is joining us virtually. And then throughout the course of the week, we have Ashley Russell, Kara Grace, Sarah Mitchell, and Jean Stewart. So please join me in singing. Happy birthday to you. All right, now I'd like to invite Carolyn McCartney to come up and read our first scripture lesson. Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined me and climbed to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see... Sorry. <laughs> it's big print. Still <laughs> Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O oh my Lord, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare to you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Here I am. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have not spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not, O Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Yeah. The Ministry of Music, the piece that we're going to share with you this morning is called Light Dawns on a Weary World. And um, I think we have the uh, lyrics to the refrain coming up as we sing it. It's very simple. It's going to repeat three times. So pay attention to it and join in whenever you feel like it. But certainly feel free to join us on the last time of the refrain.
Well, we're in the Gospel of John, and we're not in Matthew, but we'll return to Matthew next week for several weeks, almost until Lent, and then John will make her reappearance. And I wondered why the wisdom of the lectionary brought us to John, but you'll hear it in this story uh, this morning. John 1, 29 to 42. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, <clears throat> I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Chosen One, well, the next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. May God add blessing <coughs> to the hearing of this holy word. Amen.
say uh, what a privilege it is to be with you again this morning and how moved I am by your faithfulness to the church and to your pastor, Pastor Ridge. Uh, after hearing what Jenny shared with us, his message to us today, uh, it comes through so clearly in his words that he has the heart of a pastor, of his caring for you all. And uh, I can just feel from behind me your spirit of energy going out to him. Uh, maybe you were the conduit for that uh, energy supply, but uh, definitely I think he was with us in that moment, and we keep him in our thoughts as we uh, move forward together. Um, and so it becomes a privilege for me to be here. Uh, I feel like John the Baptist in a way, and sort of I'm just testifying to things in Pastor Rich is not the Messiah, but he is your pastor. So just so you know that connection there is, is I'm here for a short time and then blessings. Okay. Um, let us pray. moment, gracious God, you visit us and we have heard your word to us. It is indeed a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. It guides us and directs our very lives. We are grateful, O oh God, for your word that is among us and in us and goes out into the world as we become bearers of light and testify to that story of Jesus which brings light and salvation and hope and forgiveness to the world. Uh, we pray this morning, O oh God, that as we center ourselves and calm ourselves to hear again uh, the story of Jesus and how he calls his friends to discipleship, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of all our hearts will be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> well, the first verse of the Psalm 40 today is, I waited patiently for the Lord. Waiting patiently. We, we know that, don't we? How to wait patiently. Maybe in a dentist's office, we wait patiently. Uh, but we learned somewhere in our growing up years how to wait patiently. We hear that from our parents. Uh, be patient, Steve. Be patient. It'll happen. It'll come. And we learn how to live with that patience. And so the psalmist starts us out this morning with, I waited patiently for the Lord. And in light of things in the psalm, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know that the word patient is the correct word. Because I think what it really is saying <clears throat> is I hope intensely for the Lord. I hope for what the Lord can do in my life. And that for me takes on greater significance is I hope intensely for the Lord. I know what it is to hope for something. Uh, I know what it is to hope enough for something that when all other things fail in fulfilling that hope, I turn to the Lord. And that is something else we learn in life. Uh, life teaches us lessons. And I know what it is to hope for health for somebody. As you and I hope for the health of Pastor Rich, we wait and hope and know that God will supply what is needed uh, in that particular case of a dear friend and loved pastor. The hope for the Lord is sometimes against all evidence to the contrary. All evidence that God could enter into our lives and work something new. And so the verses from the psalm testify to us that God will rescue what is hoped for and give new life to it. 
So all the verbs in that first four verses of the psalm are God inclined, God heard, God drew me up, God set my feet, God put a new song in my mouth. And a new song is used here to say that life has begun anew for that person. And that person is so grateful for the new song in their life that they sing a song to match the gift for the hope that has been fulfilled. I just want to say to you that a couple of months down the road here, you're going to be singing a new song to match the gift of God to your lives for the hope that we share. So what does it mean to sing a new song? What does the person who sings that new song do? Well, one of the things that the psalmist tells us is you embrace the word of God. You listen intently. You pay attention to it. And you do it in total obedience to that word. Now, if obedience makes you uncomfortable, that's good, because that's meant to be in this particular song. We find that you also go public with the new song that you have found in your heart. So Jesus feels this way also. He preaches about this in the New Testament, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he talks about the new age of God's kingdom. It's a new song that will happen. And so the psalmist says, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. Now the neat thing about Hebrew theology is that sometimes when you hear that heart, it's not the heart up here, but it's what comes from the heart of your body. And so the psalmist is saying, your word, O oh Lord, is in my gut, where the things are taken in and things are made new. So it's very important for us to realize that in our age of always wanting to be just me, and thinking that new life and the new song means that there's no restrictions of any kind, no expectations of any sort. The psalmist says, not here. Not when you have a new song to sing. There are expectations. And it's taking that heart of the song into your gut, <coughs> into your very being, that transforms you and enables you to sing that new song. When God hears our cries and delivers us from the pit, from the miry bog, and sets our feet up on a rock, we can sing a new song. I was telling Johanna there that all this technology stuff with the clicker and the screen and everything is new to me. 43 years in ministry and I never used a slide in a sermon. <laughs> And I was even wanting to put a song that's very special to me. I know Pastor Rich has music that's special to him, but I've become particularly fond of you too, uh, Bono and the crew. Uh, they're now older. <laughs> but uh, 20 years ago, more than that, later, uh, it, the band was in, it was actually, I think, in Hartford, Connecticut, and they were singing on a tour called the uh, Unforgettable Fire Tour. And Bono uh, would go on to become nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And from that, seminary students started to study his music and his theology. And they started to experiment with Holy Communion in new ways because of Bono. And so, in 1985, in Hartford, Connecticut, they're singing their tour songs, their, their group of selections. And it was rock and roll with a conscience. Rock and roll 
with a deep spirituality. And the final encore that evening is titled 40. And you can go on your phone or on your computer and just type in under Google U2's 40 and hit the video. And you'll hear the new song that he sings. Basically what he ends up doing is singing the first verse and second verse of Psalm 40 and he's turned it into a song. The refrain from the song is, I will sing, sing a new song, and the crowd poured out of the stadium and out onto the streets of Hartford, Connecticut, singing, I will sing, sing a new song. And they went that way throughout the streets of Hartford, singing a new song. You know, God works in marvelous ways to bring us back to God. And if it takes a rock and roller with conscience and spirit and theology to do it, what a blessing that is. And I know that Pastor Rich has blessed you with his music of, of, that he has found new life in and new songs. And you've taken to that and taken it to heart. That enables us to be God's people today. So what do we do in terms of taking that message out to the world? John the Baptist enters our lives in this reading this morning from John. He is a testifier. He's a proclaimer. He speaks the message of God's hope. And when he sees Jesus coming toward him, he testifies to anyone who can hear his voice that this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I baptize with water for the repentance of sin. He is the one. John's whole purpose in saying what he says in those few verses is that I'm not the Messiah. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And he points in that direction. He brings all of those people who thought, they had asked him, are you the Messiah? John says, I'm not. They said, well, then you must be Elijah, the great prophet. No, I'm not him either. Are you a prophet? No, I'm not a prophet. I'm simply the one who points the direction to the one who is the true Messiah. When John sees the Holy Spirit <clears throat> descend like a dove on Jesus as it happened last week in the baptism story of Jesus, seeing the dove come down in a light on Jesus is John's epiphany moment. <clears throat> this is the revelation to John of who Jesus is. And then he hears, we think God's voice say, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The point is, is that Jesus and the Holy Spirit have no come and go relationship. The Holy Spirit, the word that's so important in this particular reading is the Holy Spirit remained on Jesus. Remained on Jesus. Now, the remain can be translated abide. The Holy Spirit abides with Jesus. He becomes the bearer of the good news through the Spirit that God gives him. And it is the Spirit that Jesus is able then to heal, to strengthen, to encourage, to bring to wholeness, to wellness, to spread the good news of God's kingdom. The Spirit empowers Jesus to be able to do that. And because you and I are baptized into the life and death of Jesus Christ, we too receive the Holy Spirit. Well, this takes a couple of days for things to happen. We're into uh, the second or third day after Jesus' baptism. But it says, <clears throat> particularly in this reading, uh, Later, when John is staring with two of the disciples, he sees Jesus walk by and tells his disciples that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Does this look familiar? You don't remember this? Take out a hymn book. What's on the cover of the hymn book in the lower corner of the hymn book? 
Behold the Lamb of God in the briars. Okay, so I thought, wait a minute, this hasn't been on any hymn books I've ever used. But why is it on your hymn book? And it's on the inside cover. Okay, I'm still searching. Oh, here it is, cover symbol. The lamb in the midst of briars is a traditional Anabaptist symbol. It illustrates the suffering Lamb of God who calls the faithful to obedient service. Hmm. Powerful. The Lamb of God. And John testifies to what he has seen and says, look, here is the Lamb of God. Two disciples, and we're moving along now. So this has been proclaimed by John. Two disciples follow Jesus because John has pointed him out. And Jesus turns to them and asks, what are you looking for? <coughs> what are you looking for? When someone shows up in church for the very first time, what are they looking for? Are they looking for direction, for meaning, for hope? Are they looking for forgiveness? Are they looking for something spiritual in their lives? I served a church, my last church I served was in Newport, Kentucky, it's a urban church right across the river from Cincinnati. Uh, very urban area. Uh, and a couple of Sundays as I was preaching, a Buddhist monk would come in and sit in the back pew of the church. Is that okay? Uh, he's here. He had his robes on. Obviously, a Buddhist. And so he walked out one day and I was shaking hands with him. And I said, what are you looking for? <laughs> and he said, I'm looking for a spiritual place where I can have some of the peace of that spirit. When an unchurched couple comes to be married in church, what are they looking for? One of my sore points, really. Kind of irked me that they were coming to a church to be married when they went to a mega church that didn't look like a church, but they came to St. John's Church because it looked like a church. Can you follow that rationale? Okay. But not being not, not judgmental. I don't want to be judgmental on this. What are they looking for? Maybe a reminder of something that is sacred. Maybe a blessing for the long journey of marriage. I always used to say to the couples, look, there's, I know you're here, and yes, okay, we'll do the wedding. Uh, but there's one thing in the vows. Oh, we're going to write our own vows. I said, oh, okay. And here we go. I said, there's one part of the vows that's got to be in there, or I won't do the wedding. Well, and it's the to death do us part part. I will be committed to you until death does us part. That's a long time. And I look them in the, in the eye and smile and I say, you know, I'd really like to come to your 50th wedding anniversary, but I probably won't be around. But I want you to stay with each other at least that long. <coughs> So when someone else comes to church and is trying to decide on a job change or a career change, what are they looking for? Could be any number of things. A new purpose in life. Better pay. Uh, respect on the job, the workplace. Um, all those things come into play. So what? Jesus turns to these two disciples and he says, what are you looking for? 
And in John's Gospel, Jesus is somebody who always shifts from small talk to the deeper questions. So a woman is talking about water with Jesus, and Jesus shifts the conversation to spiritual thirst. Nicodemus, remember him in the tree? Come down, Nicodemus. Nicodemus, what are you looking for? And he comes to Jesus and he says, can someone be born again in the mother's womb a second time? And Jesus looks at him and says, you're hungry for spiritual rebirth. Takes it to the deeper level. A crowd gathers around Jesus as he heals a blind man. And Jesus starts talking about spiritual blindness to the crowd, moving them into a deeper realm. So how many times have I missed the deeper question? How many times do we take the time to look deeper? What are you looking for in life? What makes your life worth living? And I know we claim it's all about relationships. Uh, it's all about loving God and loving neighbor, loving those uh, within your community. Love of God and love of neighbor, love of family, friends, church, love of the creation that God has given us in good stewardship. And when you and I come to the end of our earthly journey, there are few, if any, possessions that we will say made life worth living. It will be the relationships, the love that we gave and received, the forgiveness that we offered when it was undeserved. It will be the relationships, like the disciples in John 1, we were following, Je we hope following Jesus might keep us focused on the deeper things, on what truly matters. Well then, Andrew brought him to Jesus. And before this, I, before I jump to this slide, John's disciples asked Jesus, where are you staying? Literally, where do you remain? Where do you abide? Where do you dwell? Where do you stay, Jesus? Because we want to be there. We want to be where with Jesus wherever it is. You know, eternal life is really being with God, staying with God, wherever that is. We call it heaven, and it is heaven because you're with Jesus and with God. And Jesus responds and he says, come and see, abide with me, abide in my love. And so they came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. They learned firsthand that by staying with Jesus, their lives matter. So the circle widens. And it widens because Andrew brought him to Jesus, Simon, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated as Peter. Now we want to jump back to the psalm. To the reading that you gave us this morning. Because God lifts you up out of the miry bog and places your feet on a rock. It is in that being placed on the rock, out of a period of despair, that we gain security and strength. So it's very simple here. John bears witness to Jesus. Two of the disciples are pointed to Jesus. These two disciples learn firsthand by staying with Jesus. Andrew witnesses to his brother, Simon, about Jesus as the Messiah. The brother comes to Jesus and the circle of faith is widened. That's evangelism right there. Brother to brother, bringing others to Jesus. So it is on the rock of Christ that the church will be built. And is this sturdy rock on which God sets our feet 
and helps us sing a new song on the streets and to the crowds. Is that a group of people like you dedicated to the ways of Jesus? Just remember, what are you looking for? Where are you staying? They stayed with him because he said, come and see, and they found the Messiah. Amen. Loving God, our Creator, we stand and sit before you. As people who have found the deepest meaning of life in your Son, Jesus the Christ. And we are grateful, O God, for that. It's a journey, and it's a time that we take to reflect and to ponder and to meditate on the Word that brings us that gift of life through him. And we find it here at Emmanuel Church through those with whom we have fellowship and, and love and care about. Uh, we find it, O oh God, as you speak to us of new things each and every day, as we find newness in life, as each day is a new creation from your graceful uh, and great grace-giving uh, creation. And so, God, hear our prayers of thanks this day for all of life in all of its many different forms and variations, for even the hard places that we walk, the rocky paths that show no growth, but we know you are near and there to bless. And we ask, O oh God, that you offer to us the strength to sing a new song. For we look back upon our lives upon those times when we were in the pit, and you lifted us up through the kind word of a loving pastor, through the kind words of friends and family and neighbors, uh, that you walked with us through treatments and all sorts of difficult, thorny places. And we can declare with John the Baptist, you are the Lamb of God. You are the one who brings us life. And so we are grateful, of God, for the baptism which is ours this day for the newness of the water. We ask you to bless and to strengthen those who reach out to you. And I know that you hear their cries, that you know what is in their hearts and on their minds, and that in that knowing, you offer to them new life. We pray also, O oh God, for those who are refugees this morning from many places of the earth and seek the peace and seek the kind of community in which they can live their lives without fear of war or persecution. We offer prayers of God today for first responders and for the caregiving teams of hospitals and senior centers and assisted care units and for all the developmentally disabled children, for the places, oh God, that your strength is so needed and your blessing of peace and understanding is so required. And we offer prayers of God for ourselves uh, as we continue this journey in life through the various passages of life that we will find you there waiting with us, walking with us, 
guiding us and leading us to new life. We pray for peace in the Ukraine, for other war-torn countries around the world. We pray for our government leaders, that they might be wise in their decisions and remember to work for the common good of all. We pray that race relationships might be improved in our nation, uh, that we might see the face of Christ in each brother and sister. We have many prayers. And so we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with you. Amen.